Welcome back to Dista to Digital, we talk about today's most modern titles and the classics that inspire them. I'm your host, Brett Clark. And I'm Matt Keepy. In this episode, we're discussing Sony's decision to close down some old storefronts, and you're going to see where that takes us in the future of video games. Yes, and be sure to stay tuned for this week's Save Point, where we discuss your comments and answer your questions. All right here on Dista Digital. So Matt, Sony has done it. They have officially started closing the PS3 and the PlayStation Vita shop for people to buy digital games. Uh, and this kind of takes us back to our first episode of Dista Digital, mm-hmm. Doomsday for the Disc, where we talked about the ability for you know Steam to exist and it's a digital storefront. And, and we kind of discussed the the potential that like you know Sony and Microsoft can phase out games and remove games just like Steam can. But now we're seeing an entire storefront disappear. Where do you think that comes from? Why do you think that they've gone as far as to remove an entire storefront and lose support on an entire generation of systems? I think it has a lot to do with the platform just not having relevancy anymore, not really bringing in money. It's kind of something that's just out there with uh, two generations now, two generations old, three generations old. Uh, I know it's due to happen in June, uh, starting in June or July. And so I think it's just it's just a culmination of it's not it's not in the popular genre anymore of like go to for 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 game purchases. I think the digital storefront, I mean, the Vita, I don't think anyone's playing a Vita anymore or if they are, they're kind of like nostalgia holding on to uh, holding on to the old relic and uh, mm-hmm. playing the digital uh, physical games. Um, and I know like, you know, the PSP has been long closed off and the successor is your Vita. And yes, that is a Hannah Montana PSP. <laughs> it's my wife's, but uh, just thought I'd share that up. Here, here's a throwback for those on YouTube for the video. Ooh, UMD. <laughs> Remember those days? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think it's just a culmination of things. You know, you've got, there's no money in it anymore for buying the, the digital games on those platforms. And now I think they're really focusing maybe on a new handheld down the pipe or maybe just the fact that there's there's some new patents and some new options and ideas that are out there that if this is kind of like the first preemptive strike and a series of moves coming down the road in order to facilitate a, a better following, a better, you know, I guess you could say sales and um, a better platform maybe for the future. So I think, you know, no one's playing the Vita, no one's playing the PS3 anymore. Uh, it's kind of sad to see them go, honestly. Um, and uh, my hope is that they, you can still, you know, re-download your library and still play your games that you've actually purchased because that would just be, you know, disheartening and heartbreaking for those who have still playing the PS3 and the Vita or PSP or whatever storefront um, of Sony's that's now closed. Um, I just hope it doesn't go the route of like PlayStation View with the television and just completely be gone and you can't do anything to your digital purchases or the Sony's movie uh, platform as well, um, just not being able to to use that anymore. So I, I hope it doesn't follow in that vein, but I guess time will tell. Yeah, and I think you're right that there's just not the money in it anymore. I mean, for those of you who don't know anything about servers. I mean, that's a resource. That's electricity. It it costs money as minimal mm-hmm. as it might be to someone like Sony to have that server up for, you know, X amount of copies of games and for you to be able to download it. That is still an expense at the end of the day. And I don't think COVID is the blame for it, even though like COVID's affected a lot of things. I really shouldn't say that actually for the YouTube Calvin. The pandemic is actually what I should say. Um I think it has caused a lot of issues, but I don't think that's the sole blame for it. I think you've now had a PS5 launch. You look at the PS2, you saw how long that lifespan was. You look at the PS3, you see how long that lifespan is. And the last thing, if I'm Sony, is to support three consoles at a time, launch a handheld market again, you know, and we know the handheld market's not going to hit as hard as we want. So I've now allocated three times the resources than I would have had to in the beginning. Uh, Whereas if I cut off the handheld store and the PS3 store, all I really have to worry about is the PS4 and PS5 transition and a handheld. Because the PS5, PS4 transition is going to work itself out because they've already thought of that future going forward with the ability to have your account keep everything together, you know, and PS4 games now play on the PS5. So I think that's something that isn't really a concern for Sony because the storefront's the same in theory because it can 
because they can double dip into each. Your PS5 can double dip into the, the PS4 system and you can buy a PS5 edition for PS4 and then upgrade it when you eventually get your PS5. I think that's Sony's approach right now is they want to streamline their storefront. And the downside is, is that by doing that, you do eventually at some point have to have the growing pain of letting go you know, your older storefront. They did a really good job of being transparent about it. You know, one of the things I emphasized in my interview with Premium Edition Games was the transparency that they had. And Sony did a really good job being transparent months in advance. It wasn't something where it was like next week we're closing it. You know, they mm-hmm. they did a good job of, of letting people know. But here's my question. So when it comes to PS3, you could still buy like PS1 and PS2 games. How do you think that's going to affect collectors who haven't been able to play those games because it's almost impossible to find a physical copy so i think it's going to greatly affect that also because the the caveat of going back to the playstation 3 this past year i did that actually to play uh, metal gear solid franchise and my concern is that so i've recently purchased the entire package of metal gear solid my, one of my concerns is the, the the reason why I think it's gonna be it's gonna hurt both is that some some actual Blu-ray discs that are made prior to 2013, most of them don't play on the PlayStation 3. So there there was a format update with the way that the Blu-rays were created or processed, mass marketed, whatever. There's different coding in there that the PS3 is no longer updated to be able to read. And so it hurts the physical side of it, which is why people have turned back to the digital storefront in order to maintain the legacy of the console. And I had to repurchase all a bunch of games that I had physically years ago, which was fine. Um, but my concern is if the storefront shut down, are those re-downloadable at some point or will they transfer to a future project or is it just like it's gone permanently? Um, I think it's kind of a scary thing when you think about like an all digital future. And if you look at just the PlayStation 3 itself, um, you kind of wonder, will it transition to the new platform at some point? Will it just die off? Will, will it... Um, just be something that's just long gone in the past. And I think um, you have to look at also, will they do remasters of PS3 titles? And for the most part, the majority of the AAA PlayStation 3 titles have been remastered and brought to the newer console. Um, And it would be kind of sad to see some of those gems that are out there that, you know, haven't had that remaster opportunity, but we're kind of going to just get left on the wayside. Um, and I think, you know, maybe there's a future project we can look at. Maybe there's something they're doing. Who knows? There's, there's a lot of stuff going on. But uh, I just think it hurts both sides because I think it's just a dying generation. You're seeing something that's been, you know, the the, 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 the Vita and the play, PS3 store, 16 years and 15 years of, of storefront respectively together, 16 and 15. Um, it, that's a long time. And... To shut it down, obviously, is a is a resource that they can then use going forward. Um, I sense and I smell like a brand unification coming, and I'm hoping that that's the main reason why. But I definitely think it's going to change our gaming habits in the future. It's going to change our buying habits. It's going to impact us directly. Um, and one of my biggest concerns is that with the, just the digital, referencing back to our original episode of uh, Doomsday for the Disc, I think this is pushing more towards that 28 episodes later uh we're we're finally kind of seeing that happen now 2021 physical retailers are shutting down you know you got uh game rental services like redbox hollywood video blockbuster video family video um game stops physical discs are on decline i think that's all pushing towards this new digital future and i think um the the physical disc storefronts are just evaporating with like Best Buy being at the forefront now, Target, Walmart, there's still some 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 tried and true stances out there on that. But I think I think it is I think it's pushing towards a new all digital era, and I think Sony's kind of helping that along and t- a little bit intentionally. But you know I don't and I and I do get the whole cost effectiveness as well. Um, I just hope that you know maybe there's some options they can give us for you know, they're taking away the ability to trade the market back in and, and get get refunds and get things like that. They've they've opened us up to that, the possibility of refunds, which Sony, I don't know if you've ever tried to refund a game, <laughs> but 
Sony really does not like to refund you money. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I really hope that they really streamline that going forward to kind of ease our mind as consumers um, going into an all digital market, which one day could just evaporate and then you don't have anything to show for it. That's that's Mm -hmm. my biggest fear. Yeah, I think that's a fear that a lot of people who, you know, have built a collection, you know, Mm -hmm. and then eventually realize the benefit to digital, which is it takes up a lot less space. And the supposed belief that it would always be there. That was the thing that digital really, really hit home with me when I was first starting out as a PS4 owner was no matter what happened to my PlayStation, my PlayStation could get run over by a car. I still had the game, like the game I could just re-download. I would still have it. Now you're removing that, you know, option with the storefront. If that account still has that game and it just ends up going to a different play store and it's like you can't buy the game on the PS3, but you can still redeem your PS3 game in a couple of years when they implement backwards compatibility or something on like the PS5 or the PS6, that I'm fine with. As long as the record of my collection is kept and eventually I can reaccess that content if I can't ever reaccess that content, I feel I feel really cheated. Then uh, I'm going to use a prime example for uh, a game like Alan Wake, which was originally on Steam. They removed it from Steam because of licensing issues with its music. But if you ha- had bought the game, you could still have it physically on your computer. You could still download it. You just couldn't repurchase the game until they renewed the license. Mm-hmm. The difference is is that unlike the Alan Wake scenario, where you can still download it. It'd be like removing Steam. You, so you don't have the ability to use Steam to download Alan Wake. So that's that's where I really get upset about it is because if you're telling me at the end of the day that I still have access to that game, eventually, that's fine. If like Steam 2.0 comes out and my account carries over, I'm fine with that. But if you remove Steam and remove my Alan Wake game, that, then I get upset because now you've literally stolen a game from my collection in my personal mind. I, I also think... One of the ways that you get around this digital issue, uh, especially for people who've invested heavily on, you know, playing classic titles on the the PlayStation 3, is you need to hope that emulation gets better. Uh, Mm -hmm. As much as people might either love or hate emulation, emulation just isn't that great for PS3 and above. It's okay. It's not the greatest. And I think if you're Sony, you have to realize now that you've really pushed a market to emulate and no longer pay you for those games because now the emulation window opens up a plethora of people to download games, to share games, you know, to mod it, to do all this stuff to your intellectual property that where if you gave them the ability to buy the game, similar to Nintendo, they they would pay for it. You know, it's the it's kind of the thing with Nintendo is like where that's why so many people like rip Nintendo games or or torn at them, not torn them, that's the wrong word, emulate them, is because there's no way for you to buy some of these games anymore. You can't buy um, Kid Dracula anymore. They're, that's impossible to get. But yet, if you want yeah. to ever play it, how are you going to play it? You're going to play it on an emulator. You know? And that's going to be the same thing eventually. When when you want to play Persona for Golden, the only way you can play it is on a physical Vita with a Vita card or a PlayStation TV. You can't download it anywhere else. So... Eventually, that game, even though it came over to Steam, is going to get, you know, emulated. Yeah, and that's, as a video game collector, like, I don't mind emulation as much as, like, some people out there are like, oh, they're like, he, he likes emulation. I think emulation is <laughs> good, you know, for mm-hmm. for vintage consoles that the hardware you don't want to ruin, the games that are, you have to blow into them. Like, I'd rather have a consistent gaming experience. I'd rather emulate that all day or digitize it. You know, I don't mind that. But if you're going to steal games from my collection, that's where as a consumer I get upset because you're literally stealing from me after I paid you well, for it. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if you look at now, shout out to Apple on both fronts. We are on Apple Podcasts, y'all. You can check us out. It's mm-hmm. very convenient, easy to look us up. The only issue with Apple that they had, which is kind of where video games has trended with, as Apple, with going from iTunes, having your entire music library and your history there, to a lot of consumers are having their uh, their iTunes library locked behind their new Apple Music paywall. Mm-hmm. And I know, I mean, there's been celebrities like Ron Perlman, love the actor. He's very outspoken against Apple because 
he's had music since the 70s that he's rec- he's collected and he's transferred to digital collection and then to come to find out it's all it, it, it he updates his phone to the latest iOS and all of a sudden everything's gone and he has to pay 9.99 a month for Apple Music in order to access stuff that he owns personally that he purchased Mm -hmm. um in physical format transferred it to digital format has had it for decades i mean (laughs) multiple decades and then he it's gone i think something like that is kind of scary because that could be the wave of the future how they go too Mm -hmm. you know if um if we move on to our second topic here and we look at like uh these new rumors and some confirmation out there that there's a new patent for the new PS5 where Sony plans on, and uh, the whole purpose for this episode, Sony plans on merging the PS1, PS2, PS3 libraries into the PlayStation 5 storefront as a unified digital gaming library. Um, that uh, That's actually big news, and that kind of gives me hope to like, hey, we're going to be able to access it down the road. My only concern with that news piece, and I'll get, we'll get your take on it, is that are they going to go the route of PlayStation now and transform that into the new, oh, we're the new Apple. Your whole, all of your library is here. You can play every single PlayStation title ever designed on 1, 2, 3, 4, and now 5. But you have to pay a subscription. Yeah. Now. And uh, for me, PlayStation Now is very unattractive because it's streaming games. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very unattractive, un- just uncharacteristic offer that I just want nothing to do with because I don't like streaming video games. The, 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 the latency is there. The internet connection required is there. I would like, if they're going to go that route, to have a service where, okay, you pay $9.99 a month, fine, but you get a discount if you buy it for the year, mm-hmm. like like uh, PlayStation Network and the uh, Xbox Network now has kind of come in line. Um, if you take a key from the Xbox uh, Network um, and you get the Game Pass, that gives you the access to download the games, then play them. Mm-hmm. And have them in your library. That if they go that route, I'll be perfectly fine. I won't have any worries. And actually, it'll kind of you know make me align more with Sony and and their 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 future push. Um, but if they if they stay behind this PlayStation Now format and they use that as a the platform jump, I think it's gonna anger a lot of people. And I think I'll probably be one of them, considering my PlayStation. Of all of all of the the titles, one, two, three, four, my library physical is here, and my digital library between the two is probably close to a thousand titles or more. Mm-hmm. And if I don't have access to that, that's pretty much going to be sour grapes for me. Um, but uh, what's your what's your take on that with that new um, breaking news? <laughs> well, I, I kind of want to see it to believe it because here's the my one fear with that patent, and this is something that I, this would be very evil. If you get the patent and then use it to prevent other video game companies from doing that, and then you don't use it either, mm. that would be my fear. Uh, and the reason why is because I could see them doing that for someone like Xbox. Because mm. Xbox, as much as I love PlayStation, as much as I love PC, Xbox and PC being merged together, it, it's almost like you can play PC games or Xbox titles on either system. Then you can play it on your phone anywhere you go. You're combining all of that Play Store 360, original Xbox, Xbox One X, Xbox One X Enhanced Editions, and PC Microsoft games all onto your mobile phone. Like, and you can take it anywhere. Xbox Play Anywhere. Amazing idea. And I've, I've talked about it before on the podcast. I absolutely mm-hmm. love it because as a gamer, that's what I want. I want to be able to play when I want, where I want. You know, and it doesn't matter how I'm playing it as long as I can still have the same experience. Square Enix, a company that I absolutely love, their their motto is to deliver, you know, amazing experience. That's like their whole motto. They have pushed so much money into their mobile network for games and pushing mobile games and mobile games because firstly, it's profitable, but also because they have come to realize that more people are playing on their phone. So if I can make you cry to a cinematic on your phone in the middle of a subway in Chicago, I can do it to you in your TV, in your apartment, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And that's kind of the crazy thing about it is that these video game developers are understanding that, especially with the Switch. People are seeing the benefits of mobile gaming. And I think Sony is not trying to be at the cusp of innovation. I think they might be trying to prevent someone like Microsoft from overtaking them in a market share and reflipping the market because that would be a huge hit to Sony. They have exclusives. They got great exclusives and they've got a great demand for their system. And so does Xbox. The, the downside is that the, the ability for PlayStation now to be successful mm-hmm. really only benefits in countries that have extremely fast internet consistently. The United States, if you look at it, has, a, has amazing internet, some of the fastest internet per price, but the consistency between everybody is ridiculous. It is astronomically worse in some areas than other places, but you go over to like India or you go over to like Singapore, Korea, China. No, that, I'm not going to count China. China can't even play all the games, but Japan, <laughs> um, their internet is much more consistent and that's mm-hmm. where something like PlayStation now really would benefit. And, so, and Sony being a Japanese company, that might be a great idea for people in Japan and the people who come up with this idea in Japan. But in the United States, the only people who really benefit from that are people with gigabit internet. And gigabit internet's becoming more and more affordable and 400 megs exists too when it's becoming more and more reasonable for people to have high-speed internet. But mm-hmm. then you have people like our friend Aaron. Shout out to Aaron. We love you. He's got five megs. And he was ecstatic about it. He was like, oh, guys, I got five five megs down. <laughs> and we're like, what? Like, you know, like, and, and we're sitting here like 400 megs plus, and and here's this guy trying to play Call of Duty on five megs, one up. Like, and that's I was playing with that like back in middle school, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's it's it's ridiculous when you think about about something like that. And that's one of the things that I think that patent doesn't give me reinsurance as much as it should. Is that I really think Sony could pull a dirty move here and try to limit other companies from innovating. What do you think? That's that's uh, that that could be because it seems like the console wars have kind of died down a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I, I know that we there's been like a lot of news like that. There's been there's been background news over the past couple of years, especially with COVID, that Sony and Microsoft are kind of coming together in an understanding. You're seeing the social media shout outs on either side. Hey, they're doing a great job. Hey, congratulations on your launch. And it seems like they're they're kind of collaborating on a lot of things to bring cross platform together for cross play and for different console generations to play other console generations and go Xbox PlayStation together on a unified front. You look at like Call of Duty, you look at Fortnite, you look at all the other franchises. There's not a whole lot of them out there still, mm-hmm. but there's enough of them where it's starting to become a trend and it's becoming something that's dropping day one when the game's launch now, and so. I think that I don't know if it's necessarily as much dirty underhandedness as it is just like a, a focal point to go forward in the future. And really, I think I think in a perfect world, um, we would have a PlayStation network similar to Xbox network, a Game Pass, where mm-hmm. they they align and they, they since since Xbox has taken its toll, uh, taken its foot forward. And it's decided to align with the same verbiage as the PlayStation. I think they're trying to come more online with each other and be direct, just competition, be closer knit. And I think the one thing for me, for a collector of Sony games, the one off putting thing is PlayStation now streaming the games, mm-hmm. having to have the internet connection to get online to play those games. It's, it's just like games as services, you know, you, you log on to the division, you can't play the game unless you're online. Mm-hmm, exactly. Uh, and like, like Overwatch, you know, you can't play it unless it's online connection. So games like that, they really need to kind of steer away from that and just focus on a unified storefront. In a perfect world, I think you're going to see like a game pass for PlayStation and maybe they tie that into the, the PlayStation Plus membership where... You've got access to the entire library of past games for a fixed price. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll pay it. Not a problem. But just make it downloadable so that it's more of a physical thing. It's a digital download, but it's on your physical hard drive, and it's there to access when you have a storm. Um, In Texas, in our area in spring, it, it rains, it drops down, and it's like all of a sudden the power goes down constantly, and it's really irritating. And that knocks off the, the online part. Even if we get our power back on, sometimes our on, our internet's down for a day. And that's really disheartening. So mm-hmm. I think in the world of possibilities with the internet and the, the technology, 
being able to access that offline and just be able to do it on your own without that always online connection would be a big push. And I think Sony, if they would just come online with that, just kill off PlayStation Now, merge and be more unified with Xbox and just have that same direct competitive offerings, Mm -hmm. I think you get a more unified storefront than that and access to all your classic games. The biggest takeaway for me is that they're actually looking at that as... The, they're adding. Their, they want to add trophy support and go in and rewrite trophies for every single PlayStation Library title that's ever been released. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Okay, okay, hold up. Sony started DDoSing us. They heard about our podcast. They heard <laughs> that we were trash talking them, so they had to disconnect Matt for a second from the call and start lagging him. So, Matt, I don't know. Take it from what you were saying before here. Sorry about that. For those viewers at home, we'll edit out the part where Matt's <laughs> lagging for 10 minutes. But that was, it was very, very eerie. Sony must have been really yeah. listening to our podcast. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you never know. Yeah. And I think that's probably why they killed my internet. They mm-hmm. heard that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much that hat's going to help. I'm putting back on I the Sony hat. It. You never know. The PlayStation <laughs> hat might help a little bit here. <laughs> Adding a little bit more. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think uh, in a perfect world, uh, you, you get rid of PlayStation now. Um, my hope is that they do it on uh, offline as well. So that you just download your game. You pay 10 bucks, 15 bucks a month. You can download all these classic titles. Or, hey, you move the libraries over. Even better perfect scenario. You move the libraries over and boom because it's within the same family class, the same uh, brand, you can re-download all your old games. That would be fantastic. Mm. Hopefully they put an update out for that, and hopefully once the PlayStation 5s are available in store and the M.2 drive gets activated on the, on the consoles and everything expands, that maybe maybe PlayStation 5 is that all-intensive-purpose console that's going to span 10, 15 years down the road. We mm. never know. Maybe Sony might just quit producing consoles and just start really updating and upgrading as they go. And I think the technology helps it with game developers now realizing and companies now realizing they can actually put in features on the consoles themselves and kind of supplement the hardware as they go with the software updates. So who knows what the future holds? I just hope that they make it more uniform and transparent and accessible mm-hmm. and easier on your wallet instead of having to repurchase everything. Mm. So one thing that I really hope, cause you're talking about uniforming it. If they allow mm-hmm. us to, to take external hard drives and save games to external hard drives. So let's say you, you grab like an eight terabyte hard drive and you download games A through A through C, you know, and you download everything that you have on your PlayStation account. If I can take that account, put it into a drawer, so that, that way when the storefront goes down, plug it back in, as long as I can access what's ever on that hard drive, that's fine. You know, I, I'm i all for that. I think that would be, I think it'd be a lot harder to do it that way because then you could just have people clone hard drives unless you have really good mm-hmm. software on it and, and software identification on your console, which Sony would have. Sony would be really good at that uh, if they mm-hmm. really wanted to. But I, I think the issue is that in the scenario that I just painted for people, that's not going to happen. PT, prime example, you can't remove it off of the hard drive within the PlayStation of the PlayStation 4. So there's no way for you to, to duplicate. There's no way for you to take that off of that hard drive and put it onto something physical and save it. You know, that that's that's the one downside to this uniforming of a storefront is that even though it's uniforming the experience, it could still go down at any second. You know, it could still disappear, you know. I don't think it'll ever happen, but I think Sony might remove more games like Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk, you still can't buy digitally, you know, even though that they have made tremendous work on the game. They, the game's looking really good right now after this most recent update on console. But the fact that you still can't access it digitally, it's kind of, it's almost like, uh, kind, of kind of get political here. It's almost like censorship, if you think about it, from like, mm-hmm. if you look at, people who like freak out about like Facebook censoring this or Twitter f- censoring this. Sony is censoring CD Projekt Red to be able to distribute their game, you know, in reality. And that's something where it's, it's kind of an extreme way to look at it. But I think that's something where you got to look at it as they have the ability to do that now. So if there's a developer they don't like, they could just, oh yeah, you want to, you have to search that game with the exact capitalization on the correct letters and the correct spacing. Otherwise you can't find it on the store. They could do something as simple as that and then that game doesn't get sold. That's that's the one thing I don't like about going digital 
only. Like, you know, that's mm-hmm. why I still like physical games is because that way, firstly, sales on physical games do not match, you know, Steam summer sales and stuff like that or seasonal sales on the digital storefront. You can just have a game randomly on sale on the store because they have too much overhead of it, you know. And that's something that I, I like about the physical storefront. I think what you're going to see in the future as far as transparency goes is almost nothing. I think Sony's going to try to keep it under wraps because the more transparent they are about it, the I think the, the crazier people can get about it. You know, the more speculation, the more craziness can come of it if they are too transparent with it. So I think they're going to try to keep a lot of it under wraps until until they're close to, to letting it go, you know? Like, removing the store, they, they gave you like a month or two heads heads up. Mm-hmm. They, they knew about this probably end of last year, you know? Yeah. And they kept it under wraps for a good reason because if they would have told you like last year, I think people wouldn't have taken it as seriously as they do now. You know, people are buying up like games for five bucks, games for seven bucks right now on the sale. But it's, I don't see the point because you don't know if you're going to be able to access those games in mm-hmm. a month or two. So, with that being said, we took up a lot of time and I got really deep in the conspiracy theories. And let's uh, <laughs> get to the safe point before Sony knocks us off here again. Safe point. <laughs> All right, now that we're safe in the safe point here, we're, we're in a safe point in the safe point. Uh, see what I did there? Uh, anyways, guys. So before we read your comments, I want to show you guys the patch I got from uh, Premium Edition Games. They sent me the Super Blood Hockey Challenge Patch. Nice. If you guys haven't seen my interview with Barry uh, from Premium Edition Games, check out the exclusive interview in our YouTube channel, or you can listen to it on the podcast uh, wherever you're listening to it. It's called the Exclusive Interview with Barry from Premium Edition Games. And this is the patch he was talking about. You guys can see that Switch-like logo he was talking about. And I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, it does look like a, a Switch logo. But it's really cool. <laughs> really really cool quality. My dad was a little surprised because I because sh- I sent this to my parents' house. Uh, mm-hmm. He was a little surprised it was a physical patch. Uh, and I was like, it's cool, man. He was a little surprised that it was like a real patch. He thought it would be like a sticker. But it was pretty high quality. Oh, yeah. Pretty, they do good stuff over there. And they give you a little thank you card for it. But, uh, yeah, check out that interview you guys haven't. Uh, it's it's a fun time. I had a great time with Barry, and and Barry's really down to earth. You know, great guy. Yeah, but, uh, it was a very interesting, very interesting episode. Very interesting uh, going through editing that. That was it was a lot of fun, a lot of uh, cool perspectives from another person you've never known, never met. You brought a lot to the table. It felt hey, y'all had great chemistry. It was awesome. It was awesome. Yep. Appreciate it. But, Hopefully, uh, we'll get you in the seat of interviewing people. Oh, not a problem there. Yeah. Picking up tips and tricks along the way, baby. Always looking to improve. Yeah. Well, one of the tricks that you did pick up was how to read comments. So do you want to do that and take that from me too? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All <laughs> right. So we have a comment from Sir Solma this week. It says, lots of good information and I'm happy you guys brought back Tim. Hope to see more episodes soon. Hope y'all are able to talk about the difference between a pro and a casual player. What helps people improve the most in video games? Appreciate mm. that. That's a, that's a great, that's a great. Uh, that's a great debate. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's like a whole episode right yeah, there. Yeah, that's a whole episode right there. And <laughs> I, I don't think either of us can answer that because I I never was contracted, so I can't ever say that I was professional. Mm-hmm. That's that's my consideration. If, if that's your full-time job, you are a professional, you know, mm-hmm. or if you, you make a significant amount of money for it. So yeah. I can't ever speak to – I can only speak to a casual player. I don't think I know anybody who who's contracted. We might have to see if we can get like the doc on here. <laughs> I you imagine Dr. Disrespect on here. Um, no, we, that's that's a really good good question. Uh, and we'll definitely have to dive into that at some point. But to give a general gist of it, I think, you know, the something very similar is the hardcore versus a casual gamer, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I know a lot of people who consider themselves casual players and they drop 2,000 hours in Monster Hunter. And I'm like... You, you will never catch me playing 2,000 hours in a single game and call myself casual. <laughs> like, I'd say I'm a, I'm a fairly, uh, I'm soft core, not a hard core, you know? <laughs> you know? Like, I'm pretty serious about gaming. Like, I, I, I game consistently, but it's not the only thing I do. Like, I, and 
that's that's for me one of the things where it's like hardcore gamer like i go hard in like first person shooters i go hard in my rpgs like i grind i'm a grinder so I like i'll grind mm-hmm. a game out in an absolute short amount of time and just do as much as i can and, mm-hmm. and explore the world there's nothing really casual about that but I, it's just, it's in spurts it's burst damage of video games but i do it extremely well and i still enjoy the games and casual people look at that and go how are you enjoying the game when you beat it in a week and i'm like i dropped like 32 hours in a week my dude like <laughs> but that's that's pretty hardcore but it's like not not 2000 hours what about you are you a are you a casual or are you a hardcore gamer i think i'm somewhere in between i think uh you you know being 36 years old i'd say maybe rewind about 15 years i was a hardcore gamer I, you know, eat, drink, slept video games. First thing I did when I woke up, last thing I did as I fell asleep with a controller in my hand. (laughs) I think now being a little bit older, having more responsibilities and, you know, as we all hate to adult, we have to do the adulting. Mm -hmm. And so I think that kind of gets in the way work, life balance, being home, being married, being a family man. I think it really has affected that, but not in a bad way. I think it just makes me more choosy and... I think it, it. I think it honestly transcends and changes your gaming interests. Mm-hmm. So I think you would call me uh, a game video gaming enthusiast. Oh, now okay, I like that. And now that we, uh, now that we, you know, we we have a following and we're doing our thing and, and ho- you know, hopefully making hopes and dreams come true. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think I would go with video game enthusiast extraordinaire let's go okay. with that. put a little fancy flair on it there so aka a softy <laughs> softy a, software a softie. yeah yeah that's, soft, that's, oh, that's going a little bit of the Ooh, adult rated yeah. uh yeah. entertainment there that we <laughs> we're not a part of thankfully <laughs> yeah oh, but goodness. uh yeah that's that's great so um yeah we got uh, another comment here from the actual interview exclusive interview with barry carenza uh jeffrey wittenhagen says Barry the invisible hand he's the best yeah he is he is truly the best he's very well spoken to now Mm -hmm. Barry if you're watching this I appreciate you listening uh listening to this podcast we appreciate you buddy uh Barry was when I first was talking to him was super intimidating I thought that this guy was gonna to rip me alive I thought my questions I was gonna ask him it was gonna be like asking a cheese grater (laughs) <laughs> like, you know, and she's going to shred it, you know? And so I start talking to him in the discord and I tell him, I'm like, yeah, I was a little intimidated at first after talking to him for a bit. He's like, he's like, don't be intimidated. And it was great, you know? And then I realized halfway through talking to him before the warm up, I'm like, he's a nerd. I'm a nerd. Like <laughs> that's, that's all I need to know. And I'm like, oh, perfect. We're, we're on the same page. And it's just like that. It was magic, you know? Uh, and, and half the times I sometimes forget that the people that I'm, talking to like you tim uh and even barry in this situation we all have a love for video games you know and at the end of the day we're all just kind of kids in a candy store when it comes to games once it's a good game and we get excited about talking about something you know that's that's the best i do wish however that the timing on discord's a little different than the recording i wish i had timed it a little better i felt like i was cutting barry off in the recording, but I wasn't, I wasn't that rude. I'm sorry for ever listening to the interview. I wasn't rude to Barry like that. I'd never cut him off. I let him speak his piece. It was the recording. <laughs> it's totally the recording, but Barry, amazing work. We really appreciate it. You did a great job on the interview and we hope to have you back on the show again, if you're listening. But uh, yeah, other than that, you didn't get to meet Barry. You should have met him. I should have you talk to him sometime. Yeah. yeah so maybe, maybe we'll do a follow up and we'll, we'll have a th- uh, three way discord call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, next time he's going to, it's going to be like a couple months later when he's a millionaire from distributing that game. And be like, so tell us about your your experience from going from, from nothing to a millionaire in less than a month. <laughs> It'll be one of those sources. Hopefully sources. by then we'll have a little bit more deeper dive into Super Blood Hockey. Maybe we can do an entire podcast out of that. That would be fun. Oh, yeah. It gives a lot of fun. I, I do appreciate all the stuff that it's done. Honestly, like we had a great time with the, the franchise mode. It's gained mm-hmm. us a little publicity tweeting about it. Like it's been a lot of fun with interacting with it. Uh, mm-hmm. And if there's something that you guys want us to interact with besides Super Blood Hockey, feel free to leave us a comment down below and suggest a game that you want us to play. Or if you guys want to, you know, if you're a developer out there and wants to try your game, more than happy to uh, review it on here. We've already reviewed uh, Wake Up Bro. That was a great game. We got two more in the shoot, but you know, 
life comes up and it's been very difficult for me to get time to record that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm sorry about that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry. Life's busy. This isn't my full-time gig and this isn't Matt's (laughs) full-time gig. Yeah. Yeah. But you guys can make that dream true by listening Mm -hmm. to the podcast, commenting, liking, and subscribing if you're on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. That's all you got to do. Anyways, closing up here, Matt, the future of digital storefronts. I mean, we talked about it briefly in in the first podcast, and we keep referencing that one because it's literally what Disc to Digital digital is about, is the fact that you've got physical games, and that's where you came from. And now you're going to like this digital world, and there's we're in this weird transitional phase where you can do either. You can go all in on physical, you can go all in on digital, but you're missing out if you're not going in at least a little bit digital, because there's some digital exclusive games. And then sometimes you miss out on the goodies, like the exclusive game booklets or the soundtracks if you don't go physical. It, it's it's a weird time, and it's a, it's kind of a fun time, too, because there are games that are better on the physical storefront, I think, than, like, you know, vice versa, you know? I think that if you get Call of Duty digitally, it, physically, Call of Duty is not going to really do much for me, you know? But that update, that update and that speed for loading... It's much better than having to read the disc every time. You know, that's that's kind of my take on it. Where do you see the future, though, of the digital storefront going? Yeah. Anyways, so, yeah. Matt, the, uh, the, we'll reiterate that question for you because Sony hits you again with the massive <laughs> DDoS. Where, where would you see the future of an all-digital storefront going? So I think the future of an all-digital storefront is going to be kind of a scary place. And uh, when you think about it, one thing that is affected is when when you're buying a physical game, you're not just supporting the developer, but you're also supporting the publisher. And the publisher plays an integral role in the distribution of the video games. And so the publishers even do have a small role to play in the reason why they get to the storefront. And the price is what it is. And the marketing is what it is. So I think the, the people kind of like lose out on that transition and they don't realize that there's a lot that's involved both publishing and the, and the development of the game and the continuation of the marketing. And I think, I think it just kind of goes by the wayside. I think physical games are dying only because people are just seemingly going the way of the internet. I mean, Amazon has taken over and you can buy anything in an instant and have it delivered same day in most places. And in a city as big as Houston like this, there's just so many Amazon distribution centers. I can literally look up something online and probably out of 10 items, I can buy one or two of them and have them delivered within like an hour from now. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's crazy. But with the, the, the digital distribution, I think if they set a certain price point where maybe games become cheaper sooner in the life cycle of the games. And I also think that if you have a really, a really decent return policy that I think that, or if say down the road, they implement something where you buy a game, you have buyer's remorse after you've played it for a day, not just two hours, uh, looking at you, uh, Xbox on that one. Uh, if you have buyer's remorse and you don't want to play the game anymore and you want to delete it from your library, and never be dealt with it again. Maybe you get a small credit back to the store to put that towards something else. I think if they have a more flushed out way of the digital market goes in a certain direction, you can download it, like you said, to a third party hard drive and have it forever um, and then be able to put it back into your console. I mean, thankfully they're aligned where you can do that with the physical hard drive now on both consoles, both platforms and the new ones included. Um, Thankfully you can do that. That's a cool thing. But I think Digital media is definitely just going to be the where it goes in the future. Um, that's why you don't see physical CDs out in stores anymore. Um, you do see in some they're still holding on to that dying dream. But mm-hmm. I think physical music is gone. Um, physical movies is going to be next. You go into Best Buy now and that 300 feet of movies is now into small cubicles stuffed in a corner when you first walk in. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, digital m- movies, media... And I think video games is definitely going to follow suit. I don't think it's going to come yet. Um, but I think with the PlayStation 5 specifically and the, the Xbox Series X, both being physical disc versions of their consoles and offering a digital version as well, 
um, I think that that shows you that that directly correlates to your past library. So mm -hmm. they wanted you to be able to buy the physical disc version of the console, which ironically is the harder one to find because everyone's got a library of physical discs they want to be able to continue to play mm -hmm. and not have to repay for again. Um, I think you're going to see that maybe in the next console cycle, 7 to 10, hopefully 15 years from now, which is my take, 12 to 15 years would be a sweet spot for these consoles to last and to grow and to update. I think um, you, if you see the the availability of the next jump in that time frame to have all digital and that's just the way they go, I think we can accept that at that point because I think the last of us who collect physical media are probably not going to be that interested in it anymore. There's not going to be as much value in it anymore. And I think it's going to go the way of scalping and the way of reselling goes. It's just not going to be something that's going to be obtainable. You know, maybe I, I can clearly, I can totally see uh, in the future limited releases going for like hundreds of thousands of mm -hmm. dollars online because it's going to be an all digital storefront. And then the physical discs will just be basically pure gold at that point um, for those who have old consoles who are, I mean, they do the same thing every year. Going to buy a PlayStation 3 title right now, where can you go? Mm -hmm. The bargain bin at Walmart, maybe, or the used bin in, in GameStop, and that's pretty much it. Or your mom and pop shops that collect those retro titles, which is, they have extreme markup as well. And so um, Nintendo, they're, 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 they're <laughs> if, you can, if you can find a Wii title, I guarantee you there's Wii titles. How many generations old is that? Mm -hmm. They're like 40, 50, 60 bucks still. Yeah. I mean, the value is there. So God forbid you try to buy it online as well. So yeah. I think if they just, it, it, the, the, the all digital future kind of scares me, but I welcome change. Mm -hmm. And so to be positive about it, I don't think it's going to be all bad. I think if they, as long as, like I said before, they give us a way to refund or to have second, you know, buyer's remorse or second guess and to take it back or have some unique feature that it offers that, you can't get now. It's hard because I just love the smell and the the, the feeling of a kid at Christmas opening mm -hmm. the plastic and smelling the brand new <laughs> game. And <laughs> we all do it. We all do it. We take all a big it. old whiff. Yeah, yeah. Take a big old whiff of that brand new game. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing like that. And so I think if they, I think what that would be a cool option is to see if they do go all digital. And they have, they still have the game cases with the the artist's renderings and the instructional manual and a thank you card and a discount voucher for discount off their merch. You know, like you buy mm -hmm. Madden, you get the NFL shop. MLB, you get the MLB shop. Uh, CD Projekt Red with Witcher, you get a hand-signed thank you card from them saying thank you for supporting us. And you get cool stickers. I think if they're going to go all digital, definitely need to have physical cases in store at least to still be representative and then buy it physical for the digital code. I'm cool with that too, mm -hmm. but at least give us something to, to, to have on the shelf and to be able to touch and hold and to kind of hold on to that tradition of opening a brand new game, popping that seal, taking that whiff, mm -hmm. having that physical presence. So exactly. Or they don't give us that and people on Etsy just go crazy. You know, one of the coolest things <laughs> yeah. I've seen on Etsy is PlayStation one. Uh, style cases like jewel cases for PlayStation mm. 4 games. So like Ghost of Tsushima, Uncharted 4, uh, Nier Automata. Like they've got these really cool PS1 looking game cases for your mm. PS4 game. And I think that's kind of cool. So, you know, if, if if eventually comes to the point where I have to go all digital, it's not the end of the world for me. I just don't like them. I, I'm just afraid that going to happen kind of with pt where it's like they just kind of take the game from you i'm afraid of that that's the only that's the only reason why i don't love digital all that much is because i i know how easy it is to hit the lead on something you know like and you just erase it off the face of the earth you know and that's that's the one thing with an all f digital storefront that i'm i'm the most afraid of is the fact that these companies then have control over what i see uh pricing that's that's the other thing the fact that you can be competitive with other stores and other physical like brick and mortar locations with your game, you can be $5 off. I don't care. I'm still price matching you at Best Buy. I'm still making mm -hmm. Best Buy price match you, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, 
that's one of the things where you can't do that on the PlayStation Store. You can't price match the PlayStation Store with the PlayStation Store because it's always going to be 60 bucks for the most part. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the other thing is if they had more sales on digital media, you know, that makes sense, you know, to, to go digital. When I bought uh, Black Ops, not Black Ops, Cold War. When I bought Cold War, it was half off on PC. And then I bought it physically. And physically... It was 60 bucks, but digitally it was 30 bucks. But I bought it physically for PS4 because I wanted to be able to not only use it on my account, but also have it for Kylie so that that way we could play Nazi, uh, Nazi zombies together, you know, because I bought it on PC. So that way it's cross platform and yada, yada. And I could still play it on PS4 if I wanted to at the time, you know. So it's a situation where, you know, it's the vice versa where the, the, Digital was less expensive than the physical. You know, they need to have more situations like that. If they really want to get people to entirely go over to, to digital, they need to make the pricing more competitive and not the same price all the time. The other thing, though, is when it comes to physical games, we talked about this originally in episode. We should just do a recap on episode one at this point because um, we <laughs> talked about this all. If you guys go back and listen to it, we brought up a lot of these points, but we did also sound like we were in the middle of a blender. So forgive that. <laughs> forgive us. We we have gotten much better after 28 episodes. Um, although it doesn't seem like it with all the technical difficulties Sony's been throwing at us today. <laughs> um, but one of the things I said was that you maybe have to change the way that the games are given to you. So like hard drive, like if they, instead of giving you a CD, they gave you like, a hard drive with the set amount of information for that game, you know, and that we had just plug in the USB, you know, it's, it's still a cost. It's still a hard drive, but the cost of a two terabyte hard drive is like 50 bucks, you know, mm-hmm. consumer side, that's consumer, you know, and that's not even like a fast, like it's a fast one. That's a cheap one, you know? And if you're plugging in that little cheapy Ricky dink external USB drive, and you give me Call of Duty and put a Call of Duty sticker over the top of it. I mean, I don't care. It's still a physical copy of Call of Duty. It just, it's no longer a CD. I don't need the CD to be around forever. I understand that the CD is nice looking. It's round. But, you know, like, I think the CD is at a point where it's no longer the valid option. You know, when you can download things at gigabit speeds, a CD won't read at a gigabit speed, you know. When you've got hard drives that are like M.2s that have blazing fast speeds for reading and writing and have way, way better value when it comes to the grade and longevity, it, it makes it makes absolutely a lot more sense to go with newer technology. I, I just think the disc is at the point where it, it, it's going to disappear. I think let's, uh, let's put this down right now. A doomsday timer. We should have done this at the first episode. We're going to have a doomsday timer, and it's going to count down to when I believe the disc is going to be obsolete. I think the disc is going to be, going to be obsolete within five years. I'm putting that out, right there, uh, out there right now. If it is, I'm a genius. And the reason I say five years is because you're going to start to go into PlayStation 6 and the next Xbox. And, and you're also going to start leaving traditional spinning hard drives. They're still going to be around. You're just going to start seeing people going more towards M.2s mm-hmm. or uh, PCIe Express memory styles, you know, for their computer. Because you can plug in, like, additional SSDs to, like, your PCIe Express ports and stuff like that. And you can get way better speeds uh, depending on which motherboard and what brand of CPU you go with. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's cool things like that, you know. And AMD for computers... I'm getting really nerdy here. I'm sorry about this. AMD is a is a competitor to Intel, for those of you who don't know. They have been releasing motherboards that read uh, hard drives faster. And by doing that, it does better in gaming performance, which is what our podcast is about, but also in workloads. So like for someone like me, who's a, who's a 3D modeler uh, and crafter, it, it, it means that my project will load, render, and save faster. And I can upload it faster because all of that's going faster because the computer's working harmoniously. Whereas if I was to do that on a spinning hard drive, it's much slower. And Mm -hmm. technology like that is just going to get more and more advanced. It's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's going to be the same thing 
that we talked about with why the Nintendo Switch went with a cartridge, because it holds more data and has a faster transfer speed than a CD. And I think that's really, I think once you chuck the CD and go back to either cartridges, flash storage, hard drives, any other form of mass storage that is more efficient than the CD, that is firstly more durable than a piece of plastic, you know, that is read by a magical laser on a magnetic drive, you know, I think that is really where you can see the argument for an all virtual or all digital storefront winning. And that, and it's going to win every single time just because as much as I love physical and as much as I love the concept of it, the issue mm-hmm. is that the concept is with an outdated medium. If you were to say, mm-hmm. I want physical with superior technology, like a hard drive or a flash drive, that's completely different, you know? Because I still physically have it, even even though a flash drive looks like, you know, like a little brick. There's no difference between holding a flash drive full of code than a CD mm-hmm. full of code. And that's something that people have to get through their head when talking about physical media. You know, the fact that you can download something and put it onto a hard drive, that, that therefore is a physical copy of the game. You know, like giving giving this to you at the store a flash drive in a, or a CD, I would choose the flash drive all day because it's superior technology. It's more durable. You know, it's, it, there's a reason why we've moved on from the CD. There's a reason why we're investing so much money like tech companies into, you know, M.2 storages into yeah. SSDs, you know, less moving parts, you know? And yeah, let's take a prime example. I recently posted a picture of a PlayStation 2 on our Instagram. Mm-hmm. By the way, if you don't follow us on Instagram, it's just a digital uh, on Instagram. We don't post often, but we post some cool stuff. I found an antique shop, uh, an antique store, this PlayStation 2 multi-tray CD holder for the PS2. Mm. Well, that PS2, as nice as it looks, the disc tray doesn't work. You know? And that's the issue you're going to run into long-term with CD drives. Yeah. And, and that's where I, I see, you know, digital's going to win out. It, unfortunately, it's going to win out. You know, and yeah. and in the first episode, I was very optimistic about physical always being there. But as as a consumer, and as I start to understand more and more, and see, especially this year alone, the advances in technology, it's time to keep the idea of physical alive, but not with the CD. You know, mm-hmm. you, we got to find something else. We got to go to flash storage, some way, shape, or form. Cartridge, cartridge king. Cartridge is king. I'm gonna say it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the yeah the physical CD is definitely gone the way of everything else. Like newspapers for the elderly. Uh, I mean, I was growing up. I I still read physical newspapers, and then I was part of the journal Market Journal Sentinel News Company, who then just decided, oh well, we're just gonna make everything digital and like jack up the rates for the the print. And there's, there's just something about the physical print of opening a newspaper and smelling that mm-hmm. and being able to hold that and store that for, for future sake, for history, especially during historical times and polit- politics and sports and everything else. But if you look at things like you're talking about with, um, like you're saying about the, the, the cartridges, I think Call of Duty is going to be the first company to put out like mm-hmm. a four terabyte hard yeah. drive. Here's our game, by the way. Don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about storage in your console anymore because we've got, boom, two terabytes, four terabytes, whatever. Shut up right now. we got to patent uh, this. Shut up. We can't let Infinity Ward, we can't <laughs> let nobody get in this closed-door conversation here. First, yeah, just they've, already, we, they've already stolen from look, us. They've already taken it from us. It's too late. Yeah, Sony already so, hacked us, so Sony's already going to do it. <laughs> Sony hacked us episode. Yeah. Uh, we do apologize. Yeah. They got into my network and decided to like overwrite some stuff and, and cause issues. But the truth is, is that if you if you search for hard drives right now and the external hard drives, Call of Duty has their own one that they've marketed and branded, and it's like a one terabyte <laughs> Call of Duty hard drive that you plug in, and it's branded Call of Duty on it, oh and God. it's definitely more expensive than the like hundred dollar. It's like two hundred and fifty bucks or something like that. So if you look at it in the future, I think they're going to be the first company. That's going to turn around and make an actual non-disc version of a game and have it where, hey, we're sorry that for the past five games we've killed you. Exactly. There oh you go gosh. right there. It's got a cool graphic. This edition. is what I'm talking about, people. Yep. This is what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So that's definitely not too far fetched for them to be able to grab that and say, okay, we're going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's a great idea. You heard it first here on Dista Digital, by the way. Mm -hmm. Remember that for future sake. And, uh, but yeah, they're definitely going to do something with that. And I, I think that's a really novel idea to take the pressure off of our hard drives and say, here, we're going to have this with the game preloaded and yeah. pre-patched. And there's going to be enough space for our development cycle to put on there and no pressure on your hard drive. And I honestly, they could charge twice what the full games now cost, $79 for the new consoles. Or I'm sorry, sixty nine dollars for the new consoles. They could charge one hundred and forty or one hundred and thirty nine ninety nine, and still be like having people line up to buy it. One hundred and fifty bucks mm -hmm. because you're making something innovative and thoughtful and considerate to us consumers. Who you know, Xbox Series X has a has a one terabyte solid state. It doesn't have that much space. The PlayStation 5 is even worse. You only get like, what is it? 800 gigabytes? Yeah, it's like 850 or something like that. 850 or something like that. And the the, the Xbox is like 900. So, I mean, you're not getting your full capacity anyways. Mm -hmm. And these games are 80, 90, 100. Call of Duty is like 250 gigabytes on a hard drive. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's like a fourth of your hard drive or sometimes in the older consoles. It's half your hard drive. You can't put Call of Duty on an old PS4 or 500 gigabyte anymore yep. because there's just no space. So I think having the ability to pick and choose and delete content as well is one thing that I think Activision has done really well for them. Yes. And have the ability to have that game be, to uninstall content and choose what you want to play and to give you storage options. Um, I think that's great. So again, I think the disc is going out the door, just like vinyl records went out the door, cassette tapes went out the door. It's time for a new king of media to stand up. And maybe it is the digital era of media that's coming closer and closer. I think streaming platforms have finally cut the cord on cable and killed off the need to have cable in the home. And I think the streaming services, HBO Max and, you know, Netflix and all these these guys. Peacock is a great new service that I've got for free thanks to Xfinity. They're not a sponsor, but would love to have <laughs> that one day. <laughs> They're a free platform for me because I'm a subscriber that is really entertaining and awesome. And I think you see digital movie streaming, digital downloads, and, you, you know, you have people pirating things. I think now more than ever is the time, I think you're right, five years from now, Definitely in that era is going to be the changeover. No more physical discs, no more physical media. Download vouchers in physical cases would be cool, but uh, we'll see, man. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not too scared because as a consumer and as a video game enthusiast extraordinaire, mm -hmm. new title, we, we, we coined it. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited. Not really nervous. I just, I'm going to, I'm going to shed a few tears if, uh, they do decide to go the digital route and put it behind a paywall and you, you can't have what you have now. You have to toss the physical discs and maybe, maybe what we do is we take our physical library and build a mural on the wall mm. and just have like, <laughs> have it as a backdrop as, as a history gone by or a bygone era. But uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. No, I, I agree hundred percent with your, your mindset of that where it's like, I'm, I'm excited about it. You know, I don't think CD is going to, I think, I think the end of the CD is near, you know, but I think there's still going to be a market for it and there's still going to be people who want to collect, you know, a yeah. CD. And to, to those people, I, you know, I totally understand that. When I talk about getting rid of the CD, I, I'm talking about fixing video game problems from the physical aspect. You know, you, you have to have a compromise there because a developer is going to turn around and say, why would I want to give you four or five Blu-rays when I can just put it out online? And then that way I don't have to pay a distribution to, to make those. Even though distribution, I've looked at it, is not that expensive when it comes to the actual cost. I believe it's like less than a dollar that the actual CD and packaging costs them at that at that level. When you're selling millions of dollars worth of games, clearly, you know, that it, it's very small. Pennies compared to actual, you know, shipping it out, marketing. Marketing is the biggest thing. But... I think CD is still going to be there. It's just not going to be, it's going to be like the cassette. There's still cassettes out there. You know, there's still people who hold on to that, you know, and, and I respect it. You know, same thing with people who listen to vinyl. Vinyl is something where, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's just, 
it's great to collect, you know, and it's been around for a long time and there's an aesthetic to it, you know, and I think CD will still have that same thing. It's just, it's going to be kind of harder to get. And I think the way to solve the CD problem is to move to something like a hard drive. I, I really think if you put like PlayStation, whatever on the side, and you've got three, four of these, this is about the same thickness as a game case, you know? It's smaller. It feels nicer. This is a fully metal enclosed Western Digital Black for terabyte. So I can hold multiple games on it. That That's something where, you know, Western Digital is not a sponsor. I just really love their enclosures. Um, that's something where, you know, if you just gamify this up, gamify it up and make it look good, and you put like a nice booklet with it, you know, you've then changed the media to it. And then you're going back to almost like, you know, like the Atari where you just put it right in there on the top. I don't know why, why people are so upset about, you know, digital when it's Mm -hmm. taking up the space of their hard drive. You know, I don't, I don't get why that's the, the focus point there as, as Mm -hmm. people, you should figure out, you know, how do we get past this? You know, how do we, how do we move on from this? You know, instead of just, Oh, I don't want to do digital because it takes up space. Well, how are we going to fix that? How are we going to get you more space? How about we make the space on the actual medium, you know, that they're giving it to you? How about we just increase the medium that a physical copy would be? And that's yeah. that's my thing, you know. You, just don't blow on the ports. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very bad for them. But I think the other thing, closing note here for me, uh, had it was kind of hard to gauge how long this one was because we were having technical issues. Um, the 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 physical disc, if there was a way that mm-hmm. I could. You remember those like old CD cleaners where you like put it in there and like spins it and like squirts it with water, you know, those things. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you could scan the information off a disc and then put like four or five games onto a hard drive. If you could digitize your physical library. Yeah, that's actually a great idea. Yeah. I heard it here first on just digital. Um, (laughs) That's something where I would, you you could charge me $500 for that machine, I'd buy it. Mm -hmm. I buy it, you know, because then, then I don't care if you decide to do this hard drive thing or you decide, I'm going to just digitize all my CDs physically, have both, you know, have both a digital backup and have a physical backup. And I think that's, that's bad. But then technically you're copying the game, but semantics, you know, we'll, we'll worry about that later, really. But honestly, what's your... What's your take? What's your closing note for today? <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I think that's the way of the future. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to see what happens. Uh, I'm I honestly, man, I cannot to turn away from it. But I'm uh, hopefully I get a console soon. Hopefully PS Five is in the works. But there's no pressure, man. I've got a huge backlog. There's no, there's no, you know, buyer's remorse on the Series X. I'm playing on both platforms, mm-hmm. trying to find my my groove here. Trying to get back into more. Still got to beat Final Fantasy. Working yep. on that. So that's a future episode coming up soon here. And uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to where the future takes us. Um, and it's kind of uh, it's a situation now where we get to see it as adults and as as longtime gamers. We got to see the transcending into a new generation of games, a uh, new generation of technology. Just in the past few years alone, we've seen a huge uptick in technology with the way you save games and take them to other platforms and the way that you can talk on consoles with your friends. You know, there's a lot of rumors going around about Discord maybe being sold, maybe not, maybe being accessible to platforms. I think that itself, like your idea on the past episodes of having Discord on the actual console itself would be fantastic. So um, just all those things in general, the way that you can communicate with friends, the way that the stores are designed. I think I'm, I'm really excited for the future and just to close positively, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I hope that it, if it we're going all digital, that there's a way to keep it still somewhat physical in stores and still have the best of both worlds and special edition steel books, you know, things mm-hmm. of that nature. Hope the collectible side of gaming doesn't die off because that's something that's been going on since the beginning of video gaming. And I don't think that they're going to necessarily close down the collectible side of it because there's always money in that. Mm-hmm. People will always pay top dollar for ColecoVision games on eBay. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
you know, Atari games and consoles and paddles and you go to the retro game stores. That's one of my favorite mm-hmm. things to do here is to find the retro game stores here in Houston and Texas and just go and look at them. And it's like it's like a trip down your childhood. It's like wee. you just see all these old controllers and games and figures from like Chrono Trigger and mm-hmm. the like the original Nintendo gun and things, the power glove mm-hmm. and all these crazy things from your childhood. Um, I saw like the Sega Dreamcast and I was instantly flooded with nostalgia. And, um, you know, I saw an Atari and ColecoVision and I was flooded with memories of, you know, my mom's attic and having the, the, the nostalgia and the, the, the good warm feelings come back. So I'm excited and I hope they take it in a smart direction. And uh, yeah, we'll follow up in the future and see see after that doomsday <laughs> clock is done ticking where we stand. Yeah. And the transition from this to digital you know it's a great it's a great way to you know to have the show you know it's it's just a great try it's a great time you know it's a, it's a weird time and but it's a fun time you know a lot of innovations coming out a lot of things are going to change mm-hmm. when it comes to gaming and i hope that you're all in here for the ride with uh that Absolutely. being said uh it's time to wrap up this episode of this to digital thank you so much for joining us this week uh and if you have any questions feel free to reach out to us on our social medias and leave a comment on Twitter with the hashtag DistDigital. Don't forget, you can also reach out on Discord and our Facebook page where I do live streams, chats, games, and I share everything we love about games and some of our greatest gaming experiences. Yes, feel free to stop on by. And also, if you haven't already, check out our interview with Barry on the exclusive DistDigital one-on-one that we had. It's a great time. Uh, and also, if you haven't checked out our first episode where we talk a lot more about this in depth, and maybe we'll retouch the subject next week. You never know. Maybe we'll bring Tim on. You know? See you guys all coming in on that. Uh, I totally messed that up. I was doing really good. <laughs> Keep that in there. The I was doing really well. <laughs> yeah, that. Messed that one up. It, Sony. Close. Sony just tased me right now. They just tased me in the tongue. With, uh, with that being said, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And uh, my name is Brett Clark. And I'm Matt Keaton, and we'll catch you guys in the next one. Take care. Yes. Yeah, Sony, if you're listening, you did a really good job messing up this week's episode. (laughs) Yes, they did. Yeah, they did a great job. (laughs)